When discussing the open close principle, we talked about interfaces and how we can use those interfaces to protect software from change, as well as invert dependencies. The Liskov substitution principle is the third of the slot principles, and it's all about interfaces. Specifically, it's about how to properly implement interfaces. This principle says that if you have an interface and a concrete implementation that implements this interface, then you should be able to substitute this implementation for a different implementation without it being observable by a user that's talking to this interface. Seems to be straightforward, but in practice there are some small pitfalls that you might easily overlook. Let's first start with a classic example of a violation of the Liskov substitution principle just to show why it's important to adhere to this principle. In mathematics, a rectangle is something with four sides and right angles. In that sense, a square is also a kind of rectangle. So from that point of view, it might make sense to have a square class implement a rectangle interface. Of course, depending on the functions that this rectangle interface describes, this could cause problems. For example, Say our rectangle interface says that every rectangle should have a set width, a set height, and a compute area function. A user interacting with this rectangle interface will expect to be able to set the width to 5, set the height to 2, and then when computing the area, get returned a 10, 2 times 5. And indeed, if we, for example, have an axis aligned rectangle implementing this rectangle interface, you'll probably be able to set width, set height, and then get returned the 10. But now if a developer tries to implement this rectangle interface from our square, they face this annoying problem that if you set any side of the square, you want to have the other sides to be the same length, otherwise it's no longer a square. So they'll probably make the set width also set the height and have the set height set the width. Of course, when our user now executes this series of actions, Upon setting the height, it will again overwrite the width, meaning that the compute area will now suddenly result in a different number. In other words, when it comes to the observable behavior through this rectangle interface, we suddenly see different behavior. The square class is not substitutable for other rectangle implementations. As a result, the user might now just have a bug in their software. Or even if the user is aware of this annoying square implementation that doesn't really adhere to this rectangle interface, they will have to make adjustments to their code at special cases where they respond to the actual concrete implementation instead of just talking to the generic interface. More work, less generic code, harder to maintain. In general, violations of the Liskov substitution principle are always a bad thing. Now, you might say, okay, sure, this rectangle square thing is kind of obvious. No proper software engineer would implement a rectangle class if they're building a square. But it's not always that obvious. Let's forget about the square for now. And let's introduce a new rectangle class. Say I also have a rotated rectangle. And just like the axis aligned rectangle, both implement the rectangle interface, offer a set width, a set height, and a compute area. Do these rectangles now violate the Liskov substitution principle or not? The only proper answer here is not as far as we can see, because that's the thing, we don't have all the information here. Let's look at the implementation of, for example, the set width function. We now see that the axis aligned rectangle checks whether the input is less than zero, and if this is the case, it throws an error. You are not allowed to set a negative width. But the rotated rectangle treats this erroneous input differently. Instead, if you pass a negative number, it will just clamp this to zero. In other words, when a user is interacting through this rectangle interface, assuming that everything is just treating its input the same way, it might actually get different results if it happens to put in some negative numbers. And maybe this input is set by a clumsy user of the program or it's the result of some calculation that can indeed give negative numbers. Regardless, the user of your interface is going to expect consistent behavior even when the inputs are incorrect. 
The problem here is that the way we describe interfaces in our software is incomplete and often ambiguous. That's why when you design interfaces, it's important to make sure that your names are very clear. From the name of a function, you know exactly what it's supposed to do. The error behavior is documented. Depending on the type of interface, this can just be a comment above the function. But if it's a public API, you might want to have some proper documentation in place. And then when you implement these interfaces, take this into account. Make sure that any kind of interaction with this interface, even wrong interactions where you have to respond to incorrect data and somehow handle errors, they should all be the same. Now, we just looked at classes, but of course the Liskov substitution principle applies to all kinds of interfaces. For example, say we have a system level interface. We're building a web service and we offer a REST API for computing navigation data. And we have different backends that work with this API. And we have one that uses the Google Cloud computation platform, one for Microsoft Azure, and one for Amazon Web Services. This is awesome. We can now easily swap them around, uh, especially uh, when the, the pricing changes, we can just grab the cheapest computation platform. Of course, this only works as long as they are indeed substitutable. If we find out that one of the backends does this computation slightly differently, or indeed has different error handling, then again, from the user point of view, who's interacting through this REST API, they'll suddenly get different observable behavior, and their software either needs to respond to this, which means special cases, or it simply has a bug in it. So whenever you are implementing interfaces, whether at the class level, the system level, or anything in between, keep the list of substitution principle in mind. Now, we've just talked about implementing interfaces. The next sort of principle is all about defining those interfaces. If you have two functions, should they go into the same interface? Should they be in separate interfaces? That's what we'll talk about next when discussing the interface segregation principle. Thanks for watching. I'll see you then.